studies. Um, he is also uh, a writer of fiction. He holds an MA in creative writing and language arts from San Francisco State University and a PhD in comparative literature from the University of California, San Diego. Uh, he studied with several distinguished people, with writers, uh, Walter Van Tilburg Clark, Herbert Blau, Mark Harris, Herbert Wilner, Ray West, and uh, intellectuals that are well known for their work by Friedrich Jameson, Claudio Guillén, Carlos Blanco, Avinaga, Herbert Marcuse, and George Santo. Um, several of his plays have been produced, were produced, between 1961 and 1967, and many of his short stories have been published. Um, he, is, uh, uh, he is also taught, um, I'm editing out like details, right? He is also taught uh, <laughs> at San Diego State University, uh, the University, La Universidad Autónoma de Nicaragua, the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, McGill University, and the Universidad de Puerto Rico. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. He's also taught seminars at uh, La Universidad de los Andes, uh, Tucumán, and La Universidad de Madrid. He is a recipient of uh, numerous prizes and awards, including the Fulbright, the Rockefeller, uh, and other major awards. He served uh, on the jury of Casa de los Américas and the National Fulbright Selection Committee when I was a graduate student and uh, we were all trying to do very progressive leftist work. I remember being like really impressed by the fact that he was connected to the publishing house, uh, La Casa de las Américas, uh, as well as his early cultural studies work and his work in Minnesota with the ideologies and literature uh, series, which was did a lot of Central American work, was but was like very, very like cutting edge in terms of you know ideological analysis of cultural works. Um, he's so he's published his work in, in many academic journals, but also. Uh, he's functioned as a public intellectual. Often we have that, that difficulty of crossing over from academic work, but his work has appeared uh, widely because he's also made it a point to reach a more general and a Latino audience. Um, uh, his work, as I was saying, uh, encompasses uh, work of theory, especially in um, cultural studies and in left, you know, Marxist, originally Marxist-inspired analysis. His theories have moved, I hope he gets a chance to talk to us a little bit about it, have moved in a way kind of beyond earlier models of like leftist analysis. Um, and as I said, he's published very broadly in Central American literary work. He's done a lot of translation work. Um, he was uh, in conversation with some of the early writers on Testimonio and on Latin American subaltern studies, anticipating a lot of the work that would follow afterwards. Some of his more recent study has been uh, documenting uh, uh, Puerto Rican and Mexican American or Chicano art in Chicago, where he spent a great portion of his career. And as, as those of you who work in this area know, that's one of the under-documented areas, right, the Midwest, for uh, not only literature, but especially visual arts. So the contribution that he's making is really uh, very anticipated. Um, and so anyway, I'm very happy to uh, welcome him today. Very excited, personally excited, that he's here with us. And the, the screens have gone back up. And so I'm thrilled and happy about that as well. And anyway, welcome again, and let's give a warm hand. Thank you so much. Yeah, welcome. Thanks so much to Laura, Dennis, and the others who, uh, who uh, supported this event and uh, made it possible. Uh, I see many faces here from different places, including a lot of Latino students who, uh, I think when I went to school here in the brief period of 1958, 59, uh, there were not many Latinos on this campus. I don't remember meeting a Latino on this campus. Uh, so things have gone a long way since then, and I hope they continue uh, in that direction as time marches on. Uh, I'm going to be taking you on a fast trip, but we're going to see a lot of images. We're not going to get a chance to analyze them very much. You can look at some of them right now. These are just <coughs> assortment of images, uh, mainly from uh, this particular group is mainly from uh, 
the Mexican neighborhoods, primarily from one neighborhood we'll be talking about, which is Pilsen. Uh, the, the images we have are primarily from one collection called the Jose Gon, uh, Gamaliel Gonzalez uh, photo uh, collection, art collection of Chicago uh, art and uh, Latino art. And uh, that collection is now at the uh, Smithsonian, along with a lot of interviews we've done of different artists. And so what I have tried to do is um, build up a bank of images to go with the interviews and other materials that we have gathered and that are at the Smithsonian and will be available to scholars long before I say goodbye, uh, long after I say goodbye and uh, others around me say goodbye. We wanted to do this work as quickly as we could because we knew some of the people we were interviewing would not uh, be around too long and some of them have actually left us. I uh, one was leaving us in the process of we were finishing up our interviews. So we're very happy about this work. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to start by reading a little bit, but at a certain point I'm going to stop reading because it's just too much to say to read through this whole thing. And I'm going to let the images carry us quickly through what we have. Uh, there's an image of Chicago, the city you've probably seen, the buildings, the famous downtown buildings. And a lot of people who come to Chicago, that's what they see. They stay in the downtown area. It's sort of equivalent to, it's a tiny Manhattan, and it's, uh, it's a world onto itself. But Chicago is like a huge Brooklyn, more than it is like Manhattan. There's like neighborhoods of ethnic enclaves and um, of areas where there's some partial integration, but there's a lot of separation among peoples as well. And I want to uh, start the talk, per se, by uh, a quote. Well, that's where I'll go to right now. Um, in the early 70s, the fires of the Latino movement burned throughout the Midwest. In Chicago, much of Barrio Youth was ignited and became caught up in its unprecedented spirit. There were rallies at City Hall and conferences and similar calls for attention to the concerns of the city's large Latino population. The, the flames had reached me, licked my ankles and calves, and set me ablaze, and I saw, now saw myself not as one more Mexican in the multitude, but as part of a major historical shift. These words by writer Ana Castillo, probably some of you know her, articulate a central concern on what I'm going to be talking about. The Latin American explosion, the Latin American explosion in Chicago during the 1970s. In support of Castillo's vision, Cuban-American artist Nereda Garcia uh, adds, in Chicago I began my life as a Latina professional artist. I went to paint murals in West Town and teach ceramics in Kazakhstan to become part of the Chicago Cultural Affairs Council. We were all acquiring an incredible awareness. I say we because I feel that I collaborated in one moment or another with all my fellow artists and cultural workers, Puerto Ricans, Mexican Americans, Cubans. We all joined the Latino movement, defining and forming ourselves. We began to change the rhythm of the city. And I think the one point to emphasize in what she has to say is how the different particular groups began to also feel a combined identity as Latinos. And Chicago, I think, was one of the vanguard places where this took place because it had two large waves of immigration from Mexico, which had been the long-standing one, and more recently from Puerto Rico. Uh, and uh, then, of course, the Cuban sector came in, conservative for the most part, reactionary, some might say, but uh, people like uh, Nereda Garcia could not be classified in that way. She was part of the overall Latino explosion of a population that was obviously uh, marginalized economically, socially, uh, with kids having lots of problems in the school system, very high dropout rates in the school, and at first, very poor, uh, I would say, uh, or ineffective leadership to try and deal with the problems they were facing. But that situation, and I'm sure there are exceptions which can be pointed to throughout the decades prior to that, came began to change uh, in the late 60s and to really emerge in the 1970s. So I've titled the paper something about 1968, because 1968 is the year of the great changes in so many parts of the world, uh, Mexico 1968, Prague, Paris, and so on, um, but it's also Chicago, 1968, the, the Democratic Convention, 
the uproar uh, over questions of civil rights and so on, uh, the, the, uh, the leaders being arrested and sent to trial and so on, and uh, it would seem to me that the Latino communities throughout the, the late 60s were beginning to organize in terms of school situation, immigration questions and other questions, and this came forward, and a group of uh, artists mainly artists, I guess visual artists, as well as writers and other people came forward at this time. Of course, Ana Castillo, Sandra Cisneros, the writers who you probably know about were parts of this, and there were many other writers around them. But for every writer, there were several artists, visual artists, and one reason being, of course, I think that people growing up in Chicago or coming to Chicago, caught between two languages, found it easier to express themselves in paint, and of course the Mexican tradition was very large in terms of the visual arts, and so it became, I suppose, more likely that one would become a visual artist than something else. Um, and so by the 70s, also the Latino population of Chicago it ceased to be a series of small enclaves. Uh, they had initially, um, and I'm just giving you some more of these images. Some of these are more Puerto Rican here, and we'll be coming back to those. If we get that far, hopefully we get that far in the talk. Uh, and you'll be seeing some more of these images. You see some uh, representation of women in this particular one, which will be an important theme as the years go by, but not as central in the early times. Now, uh, in an essay I wrote some time ago, um, I had um, already laid out uh, some nine theses on the question uh, of space in relation to Chicano Latino art. Uh, so the first, that was therefore the title, the first title I gave to this talk. I was trying to evoke the connection between the Latino's physical and spiritual struggle to secure urban space with mythological evocations of space that were part of the Chicano and the Puerto Rican movements of the 60s. It is, I believe, true that the Latinos and the representative artists tried to sublimate and rise above their sense of displacement and the at least partial, and for some, the seemingly permanent grim space and place which had become theirs in the land of supposed opportunity. It is also true that artworks and murals, above all, stand or fall in relation to the forces of negation and gentrification they directly or indirectly stand against. Uh, I used the trope of bringing that slan, signifying the Chicano movement, uh, in one of my books and decided to use and extend it here to Puerto Ricans when I first submitted the title for my talk. But in the course of writing it, the paper, I found myself shifting back to the title of a book I had done about US Puerto Ricans taking the title as Defending Their Own in the Cold, which I now feel more accurately co covers the two groups, and especially given my Chicago focus, because it suggests the varied ways both groups struggled not only for space, but for every aspect of identity and creativity in a world not only where it snowed, but where it seemed spiritually cold, alien, and unaccepting. And in this regard, this paper will focus on my nine theses about space, but on a tenth thesis, which uh, maybe is awkwardly worded, but here it is. In their effort to express their concerns and visions with regard to the visible markers of exploitation, deprivation, and lack of respect, the deep winter they experienced in the city, the painters painted their counter-narratives on as many walls as they could. Most of them were not so much interested in living some long lost and myth mythologized Latin American past, even though this emerged in the works of many, or in some alienating, gentrified Latino future, a major theme for many, but were seeking somehow some third space of creativity and freedom in politics, work, and everyday life, and ultimately in questions of sexual preference and gender, this presentation seeks to explore the struggle for this oppos oppositional third space in Chicago's Mexican and Puerto Rican communities. So, that said, uh, let's evoke that world. Uh, of course, one of the famous evocations, little corny maybe, is the one by Carl Sandburg, which many, some of you may know of. Uh, hot butcher of the world, tool maker, stacker of wheat, player with railroads and the nation's freight handler, stormy, husky, brawling, city of the big shoulders. Every kid, I think, in Chicago schools mm -hmm. learns that poem at some point. And this is a terrible map, but it's the best one I could get offhand to just 
point out something about the settlement of uh, Latinos into the Chicago area. All this is the lake, and of course, you have to remember Chicago's a beach town. Uh, it's cold in the winter, but we have, uh, and the water stays cold until late August, but uh, we have a brief hiatus when everybody jumps in the water, and uh, including the poor, although some of the poor to get to the beach have to go through some rough neighborhoods and conflictive situations to get to the beach. Uh, James T. Farrell described that in his book, uh, Studs Lonigan, about Irish kids trying to get to the beach. And uh, the first Mexican uh, settlements, of course, were primarily during uh, the Mexican Revolution. There were some people prior also, of course, uh, brought by the railroads, some of them brought by what they called enganchadores, people who uh, hired laborers to, to work in different ways. In the steel mill area, they came here all the way into Indiana, which is further uh, further south here. Um, and uh, they, they settled in this primary area, and we have very little record of artistic uh, expression in this area, and only one book of short stories, which I've analyzed to death, quote, The Last Laugh and Other Stories by Hugo Martinez Cerros. There's no other expression of Steel Mill Chicago in the years in the early 40s, the time slave Zoot Zoot would be the parallel in the, on the West Coast. Uh, and Perry Thomas's Down These Mean Streets would be sort of a, a New York connection. Um, but this area, of course, was the early settlement and where the first Guadalupe Church was established. Uh, and there were struggles over, over the church and its direction and its leadership and so on over the years. Uh, the other wave, the other forces bringing people to Chicago were the uh, steel mills, of course, down here, and then the meatpacking houses up along around here. And of course, they were settling into areas that were Irish, uh, Polish, German, and there was conflict with uh, other ethnicities as well as some, some interactions of, of a different kind. Um, and then so they also settled uh, along here, this area here, Halstead Street, uh, which ran into Little Italy. Uh, and they were there when the University of Illinois at Chicago, which was out in the lake, in the Navy Pier area on the lake here, decided to establish, it's got the funding to establish its campus and push the Mexicans, the Italians, probably running away from the Mexicans, went west and the Mexicanos went uh, further south over to 18th Street um, to the area of Pilsen where they established their prime community along 18th Street and the streets near and around 18th Street. They were also in the area near the packing houses back of the yards. They were also, um, uh, there was also a, a, a wave of people in other areas of the city, but those were the primary ones, back of the yards, the old south side, and then this enclave here. Pretty soon they would be all over the city. And of course, the spreading out of the Mexican population, the growth of the Me Mexican population, especially after 1980, uh, brought thousands and thousands of Mexicans uh, to the city. So it is a very ha heavily Latinized city now, Chicago. Uh, and of course, it's not one that was part of Mexico at one time. It's not part of the older area. And so the struggles have been marked by that difference as well as the strong industrial dimension uh, of uh, the way workers work. They were hired frequently as scabs and whatnot and found their way. Some of them got out of the factories and established their own businesses as quickly as they could. Many of them ethnic businesses, Mexican food places, uh, and other services, uh, peluquerias, you know, other kinds of things that uh, usually the community would, would want. Uh, I'll talk more about the Puerto Rican community and where it came in a bit later. They came up much more, they came into first the Mexican areas and then over toward um, Lincoln Park, very nice area, but they were pushed out and up into the Humboldt Park area. So you can say that down in the south they were, they were touching on uh, the area of James T. Farrell, and uh, they moved, the Puerto Ricans moved over to, uh, I guess you can say, through Division Street, which was Nelson Alvin territory, if you have a literary map in your minds, uh, and up into Humboldt Park, which was really Saul Bellows, uh, Jewish enclave, uh, and established themselves there. Um, and uh, Mango Street, which is a tricky business, most people think it's a Mexican neighborhood, they write about it as a Mexican neighborhood, it's really a mixed neighborhood, and it was closer to uh, Humboldt Park, 
uh, Logan Square, Humboldt Park area than it was uh, to the, uh, the Pilsen area. Although it's complicated because you have many students, Tom Justice Nettles had many students who were in, in the Pilsen neighborhood and who become part of her story. She weaves them into the story. So it's really uh, two historical moments and two geographical places woven into her narrative. It's part of the dynamic of her narrative. But I'll go back, I'll stick with the art and leave the literature connections behind. Of course, this is the city we, we dream of, the beautiful downtown and its expression of advanced capitalism. This is a look at the city from the stockyard area. Uh, this is the railroad world of the, I guess, 30s, something like that. Here's the meatpacking Chicago that, you know, there's Upton Sinclair's general deals with that. And of course, here we have the steel mills. And of course, our great Hispanic uh, steel icon, um, the Picasso sculpture in the center of Chicago. And of course, as capital accumulates, uh, capitalists have a lot of money, and of course, the poor live in poor housing and have miserable health and other conditions. Uh, and the Mexicans certainly have those features in their lives. But nevertheless, the rich collect art, and then they have to give their art away as tax write-offs and whatnot. And so by 1879, we see the establishment of our great uh, in, uh, the Institute of Art of Chicago, um, the Illinois Art Institute, and uh, there it is. Uh, and it became a magnet. And people, including Latin Americans, came to the Art Institute uh, through the 20s and the 30s and so on. Uh, one came from Puerto Rico, his name was Rufino Silva, and he was there actually in the late 30s and got his degree there with a GI Bill. He went to Paris and uh, worked there, learned a uh, series of approaches to art that were going to alienate him completely from the art worlds of uh, both uh, the island, Puerto Rico, and the worlds of New York, where abstract expressionism became king, and the Chicago answer to abstract expressionism, which would develop. This is one, probably his masterpiece painting. It's the only one we have in color that we have found. We know that they're sitting in a chest somewhere in uh, Washington State, and the sun doesn't seem to want to let us even have pictures of them. Uh, but they, he was a very, very important artist, I would say. And he, this is the one that's in the catalog of Puerto Rican art. And it's, I've seen it in the holdings in Puerto Rico in a very, I hope it's still good, safe, very well uh, air conditioned, etc. room. One woman artist, the first woman artist we know of, uh, by name, in, the, in, in, in Chicago, of Puerto Rican, uh, lot of Latin American descent, and Puerto Rican in this case also. Her name is uh, Maria uh, Luisa Pen Pene de Castillo, uh, who was there from 45 to 47 in the School of the Art Institute, and of course brought back to Puerto Rico all she had learned, both in her own painting and by her, what all she saw, and she founded the art departments in the, the Inter-American University, Universidad de Puerto Rico, Maya Buiz, and found it was the teacher of generations of artists, including some who will come to Chicago in the 1980s. But opposed to the world of the Art Institute, you might say, was uh, Jane Addams Hull House. This was the settlement house uh, where many uh, young immigrants came, and the last immigrant wave dealt with in Jane Addams Hull House were the Mexican immigrants. And very, uh, very quickly, um, they set up an art school there. And they were into an Americanization, but they also believed in holding on elements of traditional culture, that people, even as they modernized, should not lose their traditional culture. The first artist we know of uh, is William Ortiz. We've seen a few of his pictures. Are, they're in, I think, the Charles Taylor collection. Or, uh, Manuel Gamio, in his book on immigration, um, showed us uh, some of the pictures also. This is William Ortiz's picture of coming from the from the uh, countryside into the steel mill of Chicago. It's a very poor reproduction, but it's the best I could find at this time. Um, and uh, some of the uh, young Mexicans there from different parts of Mexico. This one uh, came from Guanajuato, the state of Guanajuato. Guanajuato, Michoacan, and Jalisco were the primary sending areas of uh, Mexican immigration in the first waves. And he's working on pottery. People are coming from the School of the Art Institute. Some radical young professors and so on are coming in to teach the pottery, and they're mixing Mexican traditions with other traditions, so it's really very hybrid. This one particular figure, uh, Jose Torres, developed a career uh, later when he left the, the pottery schools, and he did work uh, on 
on uh, frescoes and decorations that were used in different companies, including decorating a lot of Pullman cars, but he never did really a full mural as we know. Our main focus will be mural art. But in the boys' club of Jane Addams Hall House, you see the first mural we've ever seen in Chicago. It's uh, in a reproduction that's in a book called Pots of Promise about the, the pottery classes. They also have this picture. There are, uh, these pottery students are under a mural done by Adriano Lozano, who was to become an architect, a significant architect in the city, and in fact, uh, one of the designers of the Benito Juarez High School, and also the extension of the Mexican um, uh, Fine Arts Museum as it developed in the 90s. Uh, and uh, you can see, I tried to take a, just give us a closer look at that mural. It has, it has some of the aspects of uh, the mural movement in Mexico, um, it's very optimistic, whereas if we were an Orozco mural, it would probably be showing everybody be, being degraded by modern machines and the labor process. Here it's all hopeful, and you can see the artist himself there, Adrián, is the guy with the glasses on to the right of the picture, very common in Mexican muralism to add the artist himself, just as Velázquez did in his paintings in the 18th century or 17th century. So. Um, uh, there's a, also, I think, a strong WPA influence in this, uh, in this mural. Uh, the first professional artist, uh, Luis uh, uh, Ortiz, um, and uh, he did incredible work with faces and whatnot. He graduated from the School of the Art Institute and really had a sort of professional career in the 1940s. So these are people, not people coming in and out. Uh, these are people who are staying in the city. Uh, Silva stayed through 1982 at the School of the Art Institute, the only uh, tenured Latino faculty member. Uh, this, uh, this is um, now Earl Ortiz, uh, the son of uh, the first um, uh, Ortiz, um, and he um, <coughs> had a career that developed in the 70s, but he was not in touch with other people in the community. He was half Mexican and lived outside of the barrio pretty much at the time, and is now hooked up with people painting uh, in the barrio in his, in his later years. Uh, the first woman that we know of as important uh, in the Mexican community was Maria Enrique de Allen, Enriquez de Allen, who came to Chicago in the early 60s, mainly known for her artisan work and teaching lots of people how to do artisan work, lots of Mexicanos and Mexicanos, how to do this kind of work. But she was also an artist whose work we're just beginning to find out about. Uh, this is the son of, um, of the first Ortiz, or this is Earl Ortiz, I, I think I missed, I, I confused things there a little bit. This is a piece of his work, the kind of work he was into acrobatics. His father had been a professional acrobat also before he became a visual artist. And they did a big exhibit of his work there. But these people were not very involved politically uh, until uh, we got into the 70s, at least to Earl. Um, and uh, in 1967, we have a major mural developed in the Chicago community, which is the Wall of Respect. This is uh, one image of it um, by, Woody, by Bill Walker who became a, uh, one of the co-founders of the Chicago Mural Group with John Weber uh, going into the late 60s and into the early 70s. The first mural, outdoor mural, that we have by a Mexican Mexicano in Chicago is this one, Metaphysica or Peace, was the other name for it. It was an anti, he posed it as an anti-war mural. He was very much interested and would always be interested, Mario Castillo, in the symbolism uh, of, that he learned from watching and looking at Aztec and Olmec and other uh, indigenous cultures. And he developed designs of all kinds and he incorporated them into this first mural, 1968. And by the way, it seems to be and seems to be fairly well corroborated that this is the first Chicano movement mural period. Before any in California, I was shocked. I could not believe it. But it seems to hold up. We, every bit of investigation we've done says this is the first mural. And the second one is probably this one. Here he is as a young man working on the mural. Uh, this is his second mural. Uh, and it's called The Wall of Brotherhood, 1969. Uh, Mario Castillo stopped doing murals and went on to do very fantastically developed, elaborate uh, art pieces of different sizes and different dimensions 
very fine work that he did over the years. This is a couple of samples of his work. But the next mural we have is a very curious example. This is a building that the Young Lords of Puerto Rican Organization took over in Chicago on Armitage Street in the north side. Uh, and a, a woman from San Diego, a Chicana from San Diego, her name is este, Felicitas Nunez, came to Chicago and uh, her initial plan fell through and she ended up spending her time painting murals on the side of the elaborate. She had never painted a mural in her life and she was never to do another mural. I interviewed her a couple of years ago in LA and she told me she never did another mural. She's done a lot of work in theater, Chicana theater. She has a co-editor of a volume of Chicana theater in California. But this is a mural she did using iconic figures uh, of Puerto Ricans. And uh, there's Lolita de Lebron, who's this, the uh, woman here. Um, and uh, I think this, I'm not sure who this is. Is this a Visu Campos? I'm not sure. It may be an image of the nationalist leader of Visu Campos from Puerto Rico. Yeah, that's a Visu Campos, they said, damn. They say, they I can't see yeah. it here. I can't see the name there. Yeah, I think it's Abisu Campos. But she weaved in an Adelita. She looked like it. You see? So there became an Adelita on this wall. So it became a Latina, a Chicano executed Latina, a Latino mural, Latinx, or whatever you want to call it today, um, mural that she did in uh, 1969. Uh, and it's just figures on the wall. It's not a very elaborate, integrated mural. It's not like some of the murals that were to come later. You can look at some of the murals that were to come later here, a little anticipation. These were done by a guy named Jeff Zimmerman, no relation, um, who has done several murals in the Barrio, very large scale, very traditional imagery in them. Um, this is a, a, one of the women's uh, images. We'll see a better image of it later. Uh, and there's some traditional figures of the Mexican independence and uh, subsequent developments in Mexico. And all, all of this is muralized in Chicago. Um, and now we're going to look at what's happening in and around Pilsen. Because by 1970-71, uh, the artists are beginning to do serious work in Chicago uh, in, this, in this area, which is Pilsen, uh, 18th Street. The first mural we know of there is done by Jose Guerrero, who was already working with the Chicago Mural Group, or he wasn't when he did this mural. But John Weber saw the mural and said, well, I gotta look for this guy, and he looked for him. He's a Chicano from San Antonio uh, who came up to Chicago to work, and uh, he was recruited by John Weber to work on, and there you can see them working actually, on a mural they did in the United uh, Electrical Workers Building, a very left, left wing kind of, uh, building they were asked to do the mural and John and Guerrero who was basically a cartoonist and learned from John some techniques and John was John Weber is a major figure in our story really non Latino is a major figure in the story uh, was reading about Siqueiros and his his methods of of uh, making complex a geometric use of geometrics to create space and movement and uh, so some of that's incorporated into elements of this mural uh, that's not too far from Pilsen, but it's along Ashland Avenue. Uh, and it's still there, I think. Um, and you can see what he's doing with the corner, the corners here, to try and give a kind of dynamism to uh, this thing which is taking place on staircases and so on. Guerrero then went over to North Avenue in the uh, Wicker Park area, which is uh, just uh, east of Humboldt Park, where Puerto Ricans were already living. This is the, this is the Nelson Aldrin area of the city, if you've read any of his stories. Uh, and he did a mural, uh, it's basically in a Puerto Rican area, so it's, he's a Chicano doing a Puerto Rican themed mural for the most part, including pictures of Albizu Campos again, and uh, other um, Mexican uh, iconic figures. And uh, he then went on to do a mural with some very fine, high-scale muralists of the Chicago mural group, uh, including this beautiful one, uh, which I guess deals with uh, um, making a fertile world, working together, that kind of thematic. Much sense of community in these murals. And then he went on in his, one of his last murals, he just died um, a year and a half ago of cancer, uh, but one of his last murals that he did was this one against gentrification. Uh, and so you can see him working in some of his, his cartooning, and we'll see some more of his work when we get to the Puerto Rican side of things, but this is the last image we have. He did a lot of grabados, 
uh, woodcuts, slider cuts, uh, as he got older and did some wonderful work in that direction too. And he led mural tours. In fact, we're taking his mural tour right away. The next artist to emerge was Ray Patlan, who worked in Chicago in the early 70s after coming back from Vietnam. He had studied in Mexico with a painter by the name of Jaime Pinto in, in San Miguel de Allende. And he then, uh, we taught a certain way of treating peasant uh, uh, culture especially. He then came to Chicago after Vietnam, went to the School of the Art Institute, uh, and when they took over, they took over this house called Howell House, which Pilsen had been a Bohemian community. Lots of people, Czechoslovakian, another uh, Central European uh, people. And as they took it over, they took over this building, renamed it Casa Atslan. And when you think of when I keep talking about Mexicans in Chicago, it's because Me Mexicanos in Chicago generally do not think of themselves as Chicano. It's basically uh, a few people who are the artists, the cultural workers, who began to relate to the Chicano movement as a whole and bring Chicano elements into the culture, music culture, as well as art culture, and so on. So this became Casa Atzlan, the center of our, of our world, our retaking of space, reappropriation of, of space. And he painted the front, and that was the original painting. And he painted the sides of the building, and then he went inside. And he painted, and painted, and painted. And there's just some of the images, I wish we had time to go through them, but we can't. Showing situations of exploitation, situations of struggle, and so on. Then he went on to do this mural, um, a little bit further away. I believe this one was really in Blue Island, uh, a little bit outside of the city. Uh, and he did this particular mural. And he did this mural, I think, in Joliet. And he did this mural, which is the history of the Mexican-American working class. Uh, and you can see this is the original reception for that mural. Uh, it's a picture from the 1970s, the early 70s that you're seeing there. And uh, some more of his work. Uh, he was getting to be better as an artist, I think. And he got too good for his riches. He left us. And he went, guess where? He went to California. He went to San Francisco. He's been painting. He lives in Oakland. He's been painting primarily uh, in California since then. One of the leading, I guess, Chicano muralists of the area. I'm going too fast here. And uh, he's now back in Chicago repainting Casa Aslan. I'll get to that story later. Here's Marcos Raya, some consider the most original, uh, uh, creative, and forceful of the painters to emerge in Pilsen. Here's a very young Marcos Raya. He um, decided to do this painting. Uh, does anything strike your attention? Any of you recognize this mural? Mm -hmm. What is it? What do you see? Man at the crossroads. Pardon me? Man at the crossroads. And where was that? Who did that? Man. Well, it was done actually in Rockefeller. the Rockefeller Center. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah. This is this is the Rockefeller Center mural that was just demolished because uh, Mr. Rockefeller did not like the politics, the paint, the, the, the inclusion of Lenin and other heroes of the Russian Revolution and Marxism and so on. Here's Lenin over here. You can see him right there. And uh, so that mural got a second life. Well, he went to Detroit and did wonderful murals in Detroit. But Marcos Raya picked up on this one of his early murals and he made it into his own. And I said, Marcus, why have you taken Lenin out? Because I'm not a Leninist and I like more of the Sandinistas. So he put in the Sandinistas and he mm -hmm. put in other things here. And um, he made one of his earliest murals and uh, went on to do a lot of work. He showed me one just last week. I took a snapshot of it, of a mural he did in 75. You can see it as Che Guevara and it has other kinds of iconographic images. And of course, muralism and iconography are very much connected. And so they're woven into this, this uh, work of his. But this is some of his more individual studio work at the time. This is the Day of the Dead today. And you can see his fascination with the figures of the dead in a lot of his early work. Uh, a lot of surrealism. He went over to Patlan's mural and he said, no, nah, I've got to modernize this already. It's the late 70s, so he, he got permission to modernize it. He put in Che Guevara and he put in um, other leaders. And uh, I think uh, Salvador Vega did this part and with a woman by, by the name of Cynthia Weiss, who was a Jewish American born in Mexico City and who became part of the mural, the Chicago Mural Group. And um, this was the new facade of Casa Aslan. And he also did 
uh, and you can see it up close there a little better. You see, you see Morelos, you see uh, Hidalgo, you see Zapata. Um, I think, is this Lucy Parkin, Parsons? I think this may be uh, Lucy Gonzalez Parsons, who was part of the, um, uh, the Haymarket um, demonstration that some people were killed in the, as it was a, a, a group of uh, people of the left uh, who were fighting for workers' rights. This is Marcos Reyes painting inside Casa Atzlan. And at the same time, in 73, as Marcos Reyes very individualistically is going about his work, uh, Patlan joins with Jose Gamaliel Gonzalez, who was uh, from Indiana, he was from, born in Me Mexico and raised in Indiana, but had come over and gone to the School of the Art Institute. Jose Gamaliel Gonzalez founded an organization called the Movimiento Artístico Chicano, or otherwise known as March. Uh, he did some murals. He did this mural on Harvard Street, really outside of the barrio. Uh, the guy who coordinated this was Ricardo Alonso, who had also gone to the School of the Art Institute, another Mexicano, and he asked Jose to do traditional kinds of uh, images of the different uh, major tribal groups in Mexico, and so there they are on this wall. And uh, then Jose teamed up with Pedro Silva, a New York uh, mosaic artist, and they did this mosaic work in the YMCA in the Mexican community. Um, but the biggest a thing that happened through March. March brought together a lot of different artists. Some of them stayed out, some of the top artists stayed out. But people like Carlos Cortez, our great poster maker, was part of March. Uh, and our greatest muralist, the one who made the most murals, by the way, the greatest muralist is another issue. Uh, the one who became the most prolific mural maker of the 1970s was Aurelio Diaz, who did mural after mural after mural. And he went to this, this is a wall of 16th Street. 16th Street is a cutoff point between uh, the barrio, which is 16th to 18th to 20th and so on, and the other side of it is the rest of Chicago to the, to the north of there. And so when you get to come into the, to Pilsen, you have to go through this, the tunnel of this bridge and this, uh, through that opening here, this opening right here, you come in here and then you're looking along the border of Pilsen. Uh, that's the border, and you see all these different images, some of them not so well painted, but expressing different uh, moments in the community. The one who did the most work on this was Aurelio Diaz. He did mural work all along this large wall, um, and it's called La Galeria de la Raza. Uh, this particular mural has different quality of work, as you can see, the better quality right there. And he did the famous caras, they call them the caras, which are the faces of different indigenous people in different uh, moods and attitudes uh, all along the wall there. Um, that's the, the last part of it, the, the, the uh, easternmost part of the wall. Um, and uh, here's another Aurelio Diaz mural. He, his murals tend to most people see them as like calendar art. They're full of Aztec, a uh, glorification of the Aztecs, of mythical themes. Uh, people, and Marcos Rai can't stand them, says terrible things about every one of them. Uh, he became a, uh, he gave up art in the late, uh, in the 90s rather, and he um, became a shaman and, and connected with the Peace and Dignity marches from Alaska to, to uh, <laughs> the Southern Cone. Uh, and, uh, but in this period, of course, he was, he was full of indigenismo. He wanted to paint indigenous culture uh, and weave in other things with it and this became his work. This is in still very good condition, this particular mural, which is on 19th Street um, in Ashland in Chicago. And you can see the people riding their bicycles around this particular mural that he did. And you can see an up-close image of one of his uh, things. And this is in Benito Juarez High School. He did this particular interesting kind of mural there. Uh, this is kind of typical of his work there also. Uh, all of these are typical of Aurelio. And, um, and this is probably the most striking of them um, that he did in the 70s into the 80s. In the late 70s, there became a competition for the Benito Juarez High School outdoor mural. And, Mark, um, and of course, Aurelio thought he was going to be it, and he submitted his drawings, and Mario Castillo submitted some drawings, and Carlos Cortez submitted some drawings, and all these people did. But there's this one guy from California, a Chicano from Ontario, California, who said, eh, we're tired of this old muralism, all these bright colors, uh, we've got to do something different. And he teamed up with a Mexicana, 
one of the first women we know involved in murals uh, in Chicago. Uh, her name was Mailu uh, Orte uh, Ortega Al Alguero. Uh, she was to studying photography at the School of the Art Institute, and she um, said, let's do something using sort of photographic techniques and whatnot. And this, uh, it's hard to tell the whole story. Um, Longoria, the artist, was happy to tell me this story. We haven't recorded his story of his interpretation of this whole mural. But most students don't that going to Benito Juarez High School don't know what it's about either. It's very abstract, but it deals with education, and Benito Juarez is a young um, uh, person who's getting education and who's then building a different world for Mexico and for uh, people in the United States as well. And that became the mural that won the competition. Uh, Radio was kind of upset, and some of the other artists were very upset that this outsider had won, and they went and vandalized the painting of the mural. Not a happy moment in Chicanismo, but they vandalized it, messed it up. Uh, Carlos Cortez told me the story that he'd seen it happen, and uh, the uh, other artists came in, Marcos Ryan and the others, to clean it up and to allow it to be. Uh, and so it was. Um, I guess I went on, oh yes. Uh, Sal Vega was another artist associated with Marcos Raya who did important work here. We're just seeing a few of his striking images uh, in his murals. Then the next major, major mural project at the end of the 70s, 1979, the Sandinista Revolution already having taken place in Nicaragua, and here we have um, this against World War III, a mural which involved, which was led by Marcos Raya, but involved several other people in both the planning and execution. It was set up like a movie film, and the ultimate image is this one with uh, Che Guevara and the Sandino flag and Sandino carrying the flag, and you can see it's real late. 70s and it's a thing. Now here is uh, over to the right side of this particular part of the mural is uh, Jimmy Carter and Reagan fighting over a missile um, <laughs> much of that time. Uh, and this is a part done by Jose Guerrero where you see the paint coming down from these the workmen on top of the capitalists here who are building up armaments and whatnot. So it's a really anti-war thing. This part was done by Aurelio Diaz and you can see his style there. And then there, this is Carlos Cortez's work over here, very cartoonish. And you can see this one, which may have been Celia Raddick, one of the women from the school of the Chicago Mural Group who was involved in the project. Uh, and this mural has been restored several times. Uh, I'm just showing you a few detail work, images of it. Um, how, many, how, many were, how many muralists participated? Oh my goodness, there must have been about 10 muralists in different ways. John Weber had broken his arm, he couldn't do it. Uh, part of um, Mark Rogovin, who was another uh, person at the School of the Art Institute, had conceptualized the, mus the mural, but he did not participate in the actual painting. Mark and I laid out the drawing. You laid out the drawing? Yes. This is Jim Prigo <laughs> from Chicago Days. <laughs> so you remember all of that? I know it well. Oh my goodness. Well, I think it's one of the great murals of Pilsen myself. It's one of the most uh, alluring and thematically strong. Uh, the museum by that time, the Mexican museum comes forward and becomes the major representation, representative space for the for the Mexican world of Pilsen uh, on 19th Street, bringing many artists from Mexico, sometimes exhibiting the local artists, local artists demanding more and more uh, entry and feeling marginalized by the museum and forming their own groups in and around, like guerrilla groups, uh, forming their own groups to do different things. They founded the Taller de Grabado, and they started making prints and so on. One artist who was picked up by the museum was este Francisco, este, oh my god, the name is escaping me, um, Montoya. And he did this mural uh, at the Clemente uh, Community Academy and worked with students on, on more mural work. And then he decorated the uh, Pilsen uh, metro stop in a vast mural, sort of like you're in Mexico City seeing the kind of things that they do with the metro stops. But this is more elaborate than anything I've seen in Mexico City. And it's filled with images and images and images, including there's a Goya imitation that he's included in his representation of things Hispanic in the world there. And you can see, you can see the graffiti and other things built around it. But he became a major a figure at that particular juncture working, and here's the museum itself, you can see an image of the museum uh, as it became, it went from being the, uh, the Mexican Fine Arts Center to becoming the National 
Museum of Mexican Art. It got certified as a national museum. And thousands of people attended their Day of the Dead brings kids in from all over the uh, all over the school. But the major muralist to emerge in the 1980s and to the present is Hector Duarte, and that's where we have the image that was used for the poster for this. There's Hector working and doing some of his work. This is the centerpiece of the mural at the uh, on campus of the University of Illinois Chicago, the Centro Ortiz Cultural Center. It's a wonderful image embodying uh, Puerto Rican and uh, Latin America, Central American and Mexican uh, concerns. He's a Mexican from Michoacan himself. Came up in 1980 with a mural conference, then met Fred and stayed with Aurelio Diaz in the early 80s and started working with the different muralists to learn how they were representing. This is his mammoth mural that he did with Mariah de Forest, a friend of his, uh, and he did this massive, massive mural. It's one of the lar I think the largest in Chicago. And uh, he does incredible mural work. He studied at the Cuernavaca School that's set up by Siqueiros. He studied all of the techniques of Siqueiros and integrated them into his work. He was even invited by the Puerto Rican community to do this particular mural in the Puerto Rican part of the city. Um, and just does wonderful work. There's a Sorguana uh, in Mr. La Cruz. There's this uh, look at Chicago with the with the pierced heart, symbols of uh, of the struggle of uh, Mexicanos in the city. A uh, more um, a commissioned piece, very lovely. This is part of an exhibit he did um, at Prairie College. I went to the exhibit. This is his house. The thing became painting your house, you know? Paint your house. And where was the idea? This is Gulliver's Travels. He's, he reads Gulliver's Travels, and he said, this is the story of all the Mexicanos who have to travel to this world and find a bunch of people who think they're giants and they're really midgets. And uh, so this was his portrayal of uh, Mexican immigration through, through Jonathan Swift's uh, tale of... Uh, and of course, lots of buildings. This was the most popular restaurant in Pilsen, Nuevo León restaurant, and look how it's painted from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, we went there and go here. This is the side of a building where Jose Gonzalez lived for some time, and then it became the home of Calles de Sueños and other different art groups in the city. Bill Campillo, who was a student of mine at uh, UIC, did that mural. Here's another one on, on respect and dignity. Uh, that one was done fairly recently. Look at this one. Uh, the young man depicted to the right here is the son of the artist Jeff Maldonado. He was killed in a brush with some gang kids and uh, um, this mural was dedicated to him. And you can see across the street from that building this mural that goes to the top of the building to paint everything. You know, in a world where you feel yourself up against the wall, uh, you paint and you paint walls and if you don't want to see the walls built, certain wall built, you paint more on walls. And so it's gone on and on and on. Now women have not been very much part of this movement, as you can tell from my narrative. Um, women were sometimes assistants in some of the murals. We're trying to find one that two women did do for Mujeres Latinas in Chicago, but they never got their day in the sun. Some excellent artists developed in the community. This is Esperanza Gama, one of our great artists from Guadalajara. Uh, and uh, she's tried to always weave in themes of immigration and uh, make her art more public, but she's basically somebody who's never, to this day, had a chance to work on a mural. And this is another artist, Diana Solis, was, who, which was one of her great photographers in the 1970s. She developed into an abstract artist and then went on to do these kinds of images, um, very iconic and comic. Uh, with a strong following in the city. Uh, this is she with uh, one of her uh, fantastic images, good friend of ours, good friend of my wife Esther is here. And uh, last year they finally got a chance to do a mural. And there's Deanna working on a mural. And this is the mural they developed. Uh, and I haven't seen the finished version. It's there now, but I didn't see it. Another woman came to town from a Chicana from Michi Michigan, got a, uh, to a job at the School of the Art Institute, and she did You've heard of The Day Without a Mexican, right? <laughs> right? You know the movie, Day Without a Mexican? This is A Day Without a Mural. She went and covered the murals of Pilsen, uh, and, and there you see covering up, and wrote about it, the absence of public work, as they're getting rid of the murals, painting over murals, destroying murals, let's have this representation. And so uh, these are some of the works that she did. And then Maria Gaspar is a woman who grew up 
in the next large Mexican community, which is Little Village, to the west and uh, south of uh, 18th Street. And she said, we must vital, revitalize uh, Little Village and start muralism and art projects there. There's some of her indoor installations. Uh, but then she got into the idea, I've got to do something. There's a huge Cook County Jail uh, out, uh, that's on the edge of the barrio and the little village. And she said, I've got to work toward doing something about that. And so she did a first solo show pointing toward uh, what she wanted to do. And this is an, uh, kind of a preview of something she wanted to do, because what she really wanted to do was to paint, to have these walls painted. Because it's right on the edge, and there are a lot of Latino prisoners in Cook County Jail, and she wanted to, but of course, she's not the first person who thought of it, and I remember another woman who went to the, to the um, warden and said, we'd like to paint the walls, we'd like the, the prisoners to participate. Mm -hmm. And the warden said, that's pretty good, but the only way they can paint it is to be on the outside, and mm -hmm. let that happen. So they never, the wall has never gotten there, but still her dream and her project is to do that mural. And now a new woman has emerged as a major muralist. Um, I wonder what you think about her work. Her name is Sam Kirk. She's Mexican. That is, she's, uh, I believe, Mexican uh, mother and a Puerto Rican father uh, with other things in her background. She always goes by the name of Sam Kirk. Um, she did many projections of muralism, and then she did some murals. This is one on, in Pilsen. She did many works in and around Pilsen, uh, and moving toward murals, and she did this mural, and she did this, and this, and she redid the Aurelio Diaz Caras. That's her representation, her new representation. There she is standing against her wall of the Caras. And this is not to say there weren't other, this is another representation. This is by uh, Antonio Medina and his picture of women in Pilsen. But this is the major one. And this is part of a project. A very unpopular mayor, uh, Ron Emanuel, has been doing all out, protecting, standing up for the DACA people, to the Dreamers, and standing up for uh, asylum for Latinos, because he's afraid that maybe, oops, something happened here, that maybe Chuy Garcia might run again, or somebody else who might actually beat him. So he's really, giving, he gave a million dollars to, to the city, to each, uh, ward gave so many thousands of dollars to each ward so that each ward would have its mural. And this was one that was commissioned by them, and she did want to show you more pictures of it in a little bit. But she also came out in her, in her uh, sexual preferences and did this, which outraged some people, <laughs> and then this one. And um, so she has been sort of the, the figure. Now, some negative things have happened, very negative things are happening with gentrification. Longoria came in and repainted his mural and took the names of everybody who worked on it except himself. It says copyright, Jaime Longoria. He's forgotten the woman who co-did it with him. She, her name is erased, as are all the other people who worked with him on it. The Nuevo Leon burned down. That building you saw with the pictures on it burned down. Uh, it's not going to be rebuilt. And here's Casatzlan before and after. It was purchased and the murals were destroyed. And a lot of the murals were going this way. This is in the Radio Diaz. Uh, but then Marcos Soraya went out and he painted, repainted part of the, the uh, against World War III and put like, this looks like a guy, looks like Hillary and Trump. It looks like our number 45. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, this is, and Ray Patlan from Oakland came in and has now gotten approval to redo the mural. The guy's afraid that they're going to, it's going to be all tagged and marked up unless you put something that the community can respect there. So they're redoing the mural. And just um, uh, before I got here, and you can see that the back of the side is completely gone. But this is going to be the new mural on the front of Casa Salon. But that part of it will be saved at least for a while. But you know, people who do murals know that murals don't last forever. That's the story I want to tell you of the Mexican community. A lot of new murals are coming up. Uh, and things are going on. I don't know how much time I have left to do the Puerto Rican side of things. Am I out of time? We have some time? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to move a little fast. I'm going to take you up um, what's it called the Paseo Boricua very quickly. You go through, there's a big steel flag put up in the early 1990s, uh, Puerto Rican flag. This is now in a different area. Do I have another map here to show you? I guess I, I thought I did. But this is uh, further north and further um, east. Um, the mural uh, against World War III is 18th and Western. And this 
This particular mural uh, flags is western, but way north of that spot. And uh, as you go as you go up um, through the neighborhood, these are some of the Im images you see in uh, the Puerto Rican neighborhood. The Puerto Rican population, of course, started coming. Not the, the two artists I mentioned before, but the population in general during World War II, primarily, and into the 50s and 60s. And by 1970, the population was almost as large as the Mexican population in the city. But then, of course, in the 70s, and especially after the Peso's evaluation of 1980, the Mexican population grew by leaps and bounds and far surpassed the Puerto Rican. And the Puerto Ricans were being pushed, they had been pushed out of the, the lake, lake area that they lived in, up into uh, this area, which is now the Division Street area. And um, that's the Nelson. But as you go up the street, Paseo Boricua is an attempt to stabilize the Puerto Rican community, to give it a home base between Western and California streets in Chicago uh, on, on uh, Division Street. And as you go up the street, these are just some of the images that you see as you go along. This is partially a portrayal of the um, what was called the Puerto Rican riot, which is known as, to us as the Puerto Rican Uprise of 1966. And of course, to uh, evade further confrontations with the police over this and that, they got money, and some of the money went into founding uh, organizations that led to artwork and uh, poetry and so on. And so uh, an organization developed called ALBA, uh, and the uh, Puerto Rican Alliance developed and out of those groups, some art, visual artists emerged. And some of this work is fairly recent uh, by, uh, say, a woman by the name of Star Padilla, uh, the daughter of a one of the person whose people has written several books on life, Puerto Rican life in the city. Uh, and usually it's a family dollar value story that your eyeglasses for a dollar and your Cokes for 50 cents. Uh, but there they put that. And this is, it's a commercial street, but covered with images. Look at this. This is a place for uh, people who are struggling with AIDS and HIV. And there's a condom as part of the mural. Um, and you can see just the signage in some of the places, some of the figures who were presented, uh, the sign work about a committee that's going to do work. And you go up the street, and right by garbage pails or whatever, you see these images, some of them now more political. So you also see this image of Oscar Lopez Rivera, who was just released uh, as, uh, <coughs> as, I guess, what was our last president's name? Our last president, Obama. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, so Obama signed his uh, release after 30 plus years in prison. And there's a little mural representation there. And then you get up to where the flags end in California. And just beyond that, you're up in Humboldt Park now. Uh, and here is the, just a, not a very good shot, but a shot of the, what is now the National Museum of Puerto Rican Art. They followed the Mexican model and made it a national museum, got certified, and they're developing art shows and artwork there. Now, the early 70s, as things developed, the first mural that we know of, we pay homage to, is this crucifixion of Albizu Campos, the nationalist leader who died in prison as uh, Puerto Rico became La Isla de um, uh, Libre Social, as they called it. Uh, maybe not well associated and not so free, uh, but there it is. And with other um, leading Puerto Rican figures in the background, and on the other cross is Lolita Lablon, one of the women who was imprisoned uh, in the 1950s. Uh, and who stayed in prison uh, until 1980, I think 81, roughly. Uh, and then this one was very faded. You saw how faded that image was. And it was restored, and the community, the building was bought, and the community talked to the landlord and said, please save this space, keep this mural, and they finally did it. And John Weber worked with a uh, young artist, and his name is coming up again. Only five minutes? We've got to do a lot in five. Okay, so they restored the image. And the, the same painter who led that, and his name was Mario Galan, also did this one, which celebrates some of the great musical talents of Ireland. This is on North Avenue rather than Division. And uh, John Weber, from the early 1970s, was doing murals in the Puerto Rican neighborhood. And here's one of his 
excellent murals. Another one, and these have stayed very well. He hasn't done much to touch them up. They just stayed very well. Uh, and this is one he did with Oscar Martinez, one of our great Puerto Rican artists of the 1970s and to the 80s, still active today. Uh, and they did this down on Armitage Street near where the Young Lords uh, had taken over a building some years before. And this is for a new world, Pano Nuevo, El Mundo Nuevo. And it shows uh, scenes of uh, people demonstrating and striking and, and also uh, struggling uh, in their trying to make a new world. This one was a collaboration between Jose Guerrero, the guy from San Antonio I mentioned early in the talk. Uh, and it's a very complicated thing because Jose is basically a comic guy and this mural is got this very avant-garde style that is Oscar Martinez, but they somehow did it together and worked their styles together. This movement to the left is a kind of a Siquero touch that John Weber taught them to do, always angle your murals. But now Oscar has settled in as a studio artist. Uh, he's retired from his, his role at the university. And this is sort of a self-image. This is some of the work that he exhibited recently at the museum, uh, Puerto Rican Museum in Chicago. The next visual artist who may be dying as we talk uh, is a good friend of mine, Gamaliel Ramirez. Uh, he, this was the cover of Revista Chicana de Kenya, a, a journal which was very important in developing things in the 1970s in out of Gary, Indiana. Nick Canales was the editor. Uh, and this was the cover of the Nosotros issue. Uh, you see Gamaliel seeing himself as Afro-Puerto Rican, which he wasn't quite in appearance, uh, but he's seeing the dead end. You see him in a garbage pail. You see the city there. What is going to be the fate of the Puerto Ricans? You see him doing happier murals. and very. He's not somebody who studied muralism at depth. He didn't go to the School of the Art Institute. He's a very New Yorkian kind of guy. And uh, this is some of his artwork. Uh, that he developed over the years. Uh, this is an image of Salima Rivera, one of the most important women poets of Chicago, Puerto Rican, uh, Julia de Burgos, a famous poet from New York, uh, all these together in this particular mural. Uh, and these are some he just exhibited last year. This is a very famous one yeah. that's on the walls in, in, uh, on Division, and it was used as the cover of a book on U.S. Puerto Ricans, uh, edited by Edna, uh, co-written by Edna, Edna de, 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 uh, and the other gentleman's name skips my mind. But this is the, the Flag University. He portrays many key figures. That, well, down here is Lolita Lebron now. They're older, uh, now out of prison in her later years. And there's all kinds of figures of people we know in this. And there's Gamaliel himself <laughs> in the picture. Uh, and there's another picture of himself, I guess, getting old and decaying, as we all do. We live that long. We're fortunate to live long enough to decay, I guess. Uh, and. Um, some of his more striking images. And this is an artist who came to Chicago in the early 80s and is now a world successful artist. His name is, God, suddenly his name escapes me. <laughs> Esther, help me. You know who he is. Roche, Arnaldo Roche Babel, who came to the School of the Art Institute in 1980. He paints by rubbing his body with paint across a field of paint. And these were done at the School of the Art Institute. He went to Rufino Silva and said, and Silva said, Arnaldo, do you want to be a, a, a painter or a psychologist? Mm -hmm. Arnaldo dropped his courses with his other, with his Puerto Rican teacher and went with some of the other teachers and developed his style and technique. And he finally did a mural. Ah, but it's not people's mural. Look where it is. It's in the St. Regis Hotel. I don't know if it was water damaged in the hurricane. It's in the St. Regis Hotel, not too far from Trump's golf course in Puerto Rico. Um, but he's a very, his painting, so we saw one sold for $70,000 in Houston at an, at an auction at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Um, this is the, the raw material of the work of uh, another artist from the island who studied with the woman painter who I talked to you about uh, earlier, um, Maria Castillo, uh, uh, Maria Luisa Pene de Castillo. Uh, and this is the work of Viviana Suarez. And it's not her work, that's her getting ready to do a work. And she does herself, portraying herself in relation to this whole question of identity. To abuela, um, to abuela, donde esta? Claro, a famous expression when somebody says something racist in Puerto Rico vis-a-vis -vis black, black people, somebody says, y tu abuela, donde esta? In other words, don't think you're, you're 
pure white blood or something like that get out of that racist mold. Uh, and th she is a very light Puerto Rican, as you can see. And so she does iconography of women. Uh, there's, of course, the famous, um, what's her name? Names are escaping me. Yes, Pardon? Si, este, and uh, here you have some of her taking children's artwork and putting them into installations which then become the basis of, of murals that she has been developing. This is a guy named Carlo, Carlos Roland, who is um, he's also known as Design. He did these murals, these wonderful murals, uh, in the early 80s with uh, Olivia Gouge, who's from the now the Chicago Public Art Group, the new name for the mural group. And they did these great murals, including one, this first one was done right by Clemente High School, the main high school for Puerto Rican students. But he got away from his muralism. He's become a world-renowned artist, too, doing installations of all kinds, involving sort of mural practices, um, multiple imaging, spaces. I have no idea what he's doing. Beautiful designs, gorgeous aesthetically, but he's lost all contact with community. And this is another woman who works with design. Brilliant woman, uh, her name is, there she is. Damn, I'm just beginning names right now, so it's terrible. Um, Candida Alvarez, uh, who just did a major exhibit at the Cultural Center downtown Chicago, she teaches at the School of the Art Institute. She's from New York. She does it, that's like be her version of a day job. And uh, clearly into fashion, design, and things of that sort, colors. And she was commissioned by the mayor to do a mural outdoors, and look, it's not in the barrio, it's on the riverfront uh, in this downtown Chicago. Probably the largest mural done by a woman uh, in the city uh, uh, to this day. And there's the mayor, our favorite mayor, at the <laughs> event celebrating her mural in the city. But my favorite, I guess, uh, new artist, Puerto Rican artist, is uh, Sandra Anton Giorgi. Uh, these are her, her images, her small paintings, and already her move toward muralism. Um, as she's done these particular images. Um, I'm going very quickly through some of her images to get us to um, uh, it says number do black lives matter, right? And then here's uh, dark matter. Mm -hmm and the celebration with Sam Kirk. And so, uh, what I've got here now are different images of this mural that was done by Sam Kirk and, uh, and Sandra and Anton Georgi that are, part of the, um, that are part of the mayor's campaign to muralize the city once again. And there they are, you can see lots of pictures of them working. I just wanted to give you this image. Now the women muralists have really fully begun in Chicago with this project. There they are working on it. Lots of pictures of it. We're almost near the end of our show, our talk here now. Um, lots of images working away. And then, Sam Burke, remember Mexican Rican, she makes the bridge between the two communities complete. She got uh, commissioned to do doorways along the same street we saw before. We didn't have the doorways before. And you can see the Oscar Lopez image is part of that. Uh, these other images are part of this. Different artists, she, she, instead of being one of the women assistants on this male, the male artist group, she is the leader of the group, and she has several guys who did several of the murals under her direction, and well, she coordinated, they were doing a lot of them. A lot of them are from the School of the Art Institute. Since the economic crisis in Puerto Rico, of course, um, many artists, there are more Puerto Rican artists in Chicago now, by, by, great, by great margin than there were before. And they're all uh, media savvy. They all have web pages, and they all have studios in Chicago, in New York, and in Puerto Rico, because they have uncles in different places, you know, so they have studios in different places. And they're not being facetious, but they have, really, their numbers, I cannot keep up with the numbers. And of course, now with Maria, just last week, Esther and I attended a fundraiser for the hurricane, uh, and we met a whole new group of artists who had just come to the city and we're probably going to stay, go to the Art Institute and stay and who knows what they'll do um, as uh, things go on in Chicago. Um, of course, gentrification is still there and is taking over and people are fighting and struggling against it. How, to what degree can they win? To what degree can you win 
uh, against the odds and of the city. I mean, really, that 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 picture I showed you that where Guerrero and and uh, Oscar Martinez teamed up. I didn't say enough about that. It was Smash Plan 21, which was the initial plan to gentrify the Pilsen area. And so they joined together to, to paint that painting. And so many of the works have been directly or indirectly against gentrification, against the war machine, against the exploitation of, of Latinos. Problem questions with gangs and this and that are part of it. And throughout Little Village, where Maria Gaspar is hoping to have the next artistic renaissance, you see the same kind of things you see in San Francisco. The alleys with garage doors all painted over, many of them uh, expressing in symbolic language the struggle that Latinos are making on the walls as they are in their everyday lives in the city. And thank you very much.